Section 4 of The History of England, from the Accession of James the Second, Volume 3, Chapter 15. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. The History of England, from the Accession of James the Second, Volume 3, Chapter 15, by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Section 4. A few hours after the prorogation, a hundred and fifty Tory members of Parliament had a parting dinner together at the Apollo Tavern in Fleet Street, before they set out for their counties. They were in better temper with William than they had been since his father-in-law had been turned out of Whitehall. They had scarcely recovered from the joyful surprise with which they had heard it announced from the throne that the session was at an end. The recollection of their danger, and the sense of their deliverance, were still fresh. They talked of repairing to court in a body to testify their gratitude, but they were induced to forego their intention, and not without cause, for a great crowd of squires, after a revel, at which doubtless neither October nor Claret had been spared, might have caused some inconvenience in the presence chamber. Sir John Lowther, who in wealth and influence was inferior to no country gentleman of that age, was deputed to carry the thanks of the assembly to the palace. He spoke, he told the king, the sense of a great body of honest gentlemen. They begged his majesty to be assured that they would in their counties do their best to serve him, and they cordially wished him a safe voyage to Ireland, a complete victory, a speedy return, and a long and happy reign. During the following week, many, who had never shown their faces in the circle at St. James since the Revolution, went to kiss the king's hand. So warmly indeed did those who had hitherto been regarded as half-Jacobites express their approbation of the policy of the government, that the thoroughgoing Jacobites were much disgusted, and complained bitterly of the strange blindness which seemed to have come on the sons of the Church of England. All the acts of William at this time indicated his determination to restrain, steadily though gently, the violence of the Whigs, and to conciliate, if possible, the good will of the Tories. Several persons whom the Commons had thrown into prison for treason were set at liberty on bail. The prelates, who held that their allegiance was still due to James, were treated with a tenderness rare in the history of revolutions. Within a week after the prorogation, the first of February came, the day on which those ecclesiastics who refused to take the oath were to be finally deprived. Several of the suspended clergy, after holding out till the last moment, swore just in time to save themselves from beggary. But the primate and five of his suffragans were still inflexible. They consequently forfeited their bishoprics, but Sancroft was informed that the king had not yet relinquished the hope of being able to make some arrangement which might avert the necessity of appointing successors, and that the non-juring prelates might continue for the present to reside in their palaces. Their receivers were appointed receivers for the crown, and continued to collect the revenues of the vacant sees. Similar indulgence was shown to some divines of lower rank. Sherlock, in particular, continued, after his deprivation, to live unmolested in his official mansion close to the temple church. And now appeared a proclamation dissolving the Parliament. The writs for a general election went out, and soon every part of the kingdom was in a ferment. Van Sitters, who had resided in England during many eventful years, declared that he had never seen London more violently agitated. The excitement was kept up by compositions of all sorts, from sermons with sixteen heads down to jingling street ballads. Lists of divisions were, for the first time in our history, printed and dispersed for the information of constituent bodies. Two of these lists may still be seen in old libraries. One of the two, circulated by the Whigs, contained the names of those Tories who had voted against declaring the throne vacant. The other, circulated by the Tories, contained the names of those Whigs who had supported the Sacheverell Clause. It soon became clear that public feeling had undergone a great change during the year which had elapsed since the Convention had met, and it is impossible to deny that this change was, 
at least in part, the natural consequence and the just punishment of the intemperate and vindictive conduct of the Whigs. Of the City of London they thought themselves sure. The livery had in the preceding year returned four zealous Whigs without a contest. But all the four had voted for the Sacheverell Clause, and by that clause many of the merchant princes of Lombard Street and Cornhill, men powerful in the twelve great companies, men whom the goldsmiths followed humbly, hat in hand, up and down the arcades of the Royal Exchange, would have been turned with all indignity out of the court of aldermen and out of the common council. The struggle was for life or death. No exertions, no artifices were spared. William wrote to Portland that the Whigs of the city, in their despair, stuck at nothing, and that, as they went on, they would soon stand as much in need of an act of indemnity as the Tories. Four Tories, however, were returned, and that by so decisive a majority, that the Tory who stood lowest pulled four hundred votes more than the Whig who stood highest. The sheriffs, desiring to defer as long as possible the triumph of their enemies, granted a scrutiny. But though the majority was diminished, the result was not affected. At Westminster, two opponents of the Sacheverell Clause were elected without a contest. But nothing indicated more strongly the disgust excited by the proceedings of the late House of Commons than what passed in the University of Cambridge. Newton retired to his quiet observatory over the gate of Trinity College. Two Tories were returned by an overwhelming majority. At the head of the poll was Sawyer, who had, but a few days before, been accepted from the indemnity bill and expelled from the House of Commons. The records of the university contain curious proofs that the unwise severity with which he had been treated had raised an enthusiastic feeling in his favor. Newton voted for Sawyer, and this remarkable fact justifies us in believing that the great philosopher, in whose genius and virtue the Whig party justly glories, had seen the headstrong and revengeful conduct of that party with concern and disapprobation. It was soon plain that the Tories would have a majority in the new House of Commons. All the leading Whigs, however, obtained seats, with one exception. John Hampden, was excluded, and was regretted only by the most intolerant and unreasonable members of his party. The king, meanwhile, was making, in almost every department of the executive government, a change corresponding to the change which the general election was making in the composition of the legislature. Still, however, he did not think of forming what is now called a ministry. He still reserved to himself more especially the direction of foreign affairs and he superintended with minute attention all the preparations for the approaching campaign in Ireland. In his confidential letters he complained that he had to perform, with little or no assistance, the task of organizing the disorganized military establishments of the kingdom. The work, he said, was heavy, but it must be done, for everything depended on it. In general, the government was still a government by independent departments, and in almost every department Whigs and Tories were still mingled, though not exactly in the old proportions. The Whig element had decidedly predominated in 1689. The Tory element predominated, though not very decidedly, in 1690. Halifax had laid down the Privy Seal. It was offered to Chesterfield, a Tory who had voted in the convention for a regency but Chesterfield refused to quit his country house and gardens in Derbyshire for the court and the council chamber, and the privy seal was put into commission. Carmarthen was now the chief adviser of the Crown on all matters relating to the internal administration and to the management of the two houses of Parliament. The White Staff, and the immense power which accompanied the White Staff, William was still determined never to entrust to any subject. Kermarthen, therefore, continued to be Lord President, but he took possession of a suite of apartments in St. James Palace, which was considered as peculiarly belonging to the Prime Minister. He had, during the preceding year, pleaded ill health as an excuse for seldom appearing at the Council Board, and the plea was not without foundation, 
for his digestive organs had some morbid peculiarities which puzzled the whole college of physicians. His complexion was livid, his frame was meagre, and his face, handsome and intellectual as it was, had a haggard look which indicated the restlessness of pain as well as the restlessness of ambition. As soon, however, as he was once more minister, he applied himself strenuously to business, and toiled every day, and all day long, with an energy which amazed everybody who saw his ghastly countenance and tottering gait. Though he could not obtain for himself the office of Lord Treasurer, his influence at the Treasury was great. Monmouth, the first commissioner, and Delamere, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, two of the most violent Whigs in England, quitted their seats. On this, as on many other occasions, it appeared that they had nothing but their Whiggism in common. The volatile Monmouth, sensible that he had none of the qualities of a financier, seems to have taken no personal offence at being removed from a place which he never ought to have occupied. He thankfully accepted a pension, which his profuse habits made necessary to him, and still continued to attend councils, to frequent the court, and to discharge the duties of a lord of the bedchamber. He also tried to make himself useful in military business, which he understood, if not well, yet better than most of his brother nobles. And he professed, during a few months, a great regard for Caermarthen. Delamere was in a very different mood. It was in vain that his services were overpaid with honours and riches. He was created Earl of Warrington. He obtained a grant of all the lands that could be discovered belonging to Jesuits in five or six counties. A demand made by him on account of expenses incurred at the time of the Revolution was allowed, and he carried with him into retirement, as the reward of his patriotic exertions, a large sum, which the State could ill spare. But his anger was not to be so appeased, and to the end of his life he continued to complain bitterly of the ingratitude with which he and his party had been treated. Sir John Lowther became First Lord of the Treasury, and was the person of whom Caermarthen chiefly relied for the conduct of the ostensible business of the House of Commons. Lowther was a man of ancient descent, ample estate, and great parliamentary interest. Though not an old man, he was an old senator, for he had, before he was of age, succeeded his father as knight of the shire for Westmoreland. In truth, the representation of Westmoreland was almost as much one of the hereditaments of the Lowther family as Lowther Hall. Sir John's abilities were respectable. His manners, though sarcastically noticed in contemporary lampoons as too formal, were eminently courteous. His personal courage he was but too ready to prove. His morals were irreproachable. His time was divided between respectable labours and respectable pleasures. His chief business was to attend the House of Commons, and to preside on the bench of justice. His favourite amusements were reading and gardening. In opinions he was a very moderate Tory. He was attached to hereditary monarchy and to the established church, but he had concurred in the revolution. He had no misgivings touching the title of William and Mary. He had sworn allegiance to them without any mental reservation, and he appears to have strictly kept his oath. Between him and Caermarthen there was a close connection. They had acted together cordially in the northern insurrection, and they agreed in their political views, as nearly as a very cunning statesman and a very honest country gentleman could be expected to agree. By Caermarthen's influence, Lowther was now raised to one of the most important places in the kingdom. Unfortunately, it was a place requiring qualities very different from those which suffice to make a valuable county member and chairman of quarter sessions. The tongue of the new First Lord of the Treasury was not sufficiently ready, nor was his temper sufficiently callous for his post. He had neither adroitness, nor parry, nor fortitude to endure the jibes and reproaches to which, in his new character of courtier and placeman, he was exposed. There was also something to be done which he was too scrupulous to do, something which had never been done by Wolsey or Burley, something which has never been done by any English statesman of our generation, but which, from the time of Charles the Second to the time of George the Third, 
was one of the most important parts of the business of a minister. The history of the rise, progress, and decline of parliamentary corruption in England still remains to be written. No subject has called forth a greater quantity of eloquent vituperation and stinging sarcasm. Three generations of serious and of sportive writers wept and laughed over the venality of the Senate. That venality was denounced on the hustings, anathematized from the pulpit, and burlesqued on the stage, was attacked by Pope in brilliant verse, and by Bolingbroke in stately prose, by Swift with savage hatred, and by Gay with festive malice. The voices of Tories and Whigs, of Johnson and Ackenside, of Smollett and Fielding, contributed to swell the cry. But none of those who railed, or of those who jested, took the trouble to verify the phenomena, or to trace them to the real causes. Sometimes the evil was imputed to the depravity of a particular minister, but, when he had been driven from power, and when those who had most loudly accused him governed in his stead, it was found that the change of men had produced no change of system. Sometimes the evil was imputed to the degeneracy of the national character. Luxury and cupidity, it was said, had produced in our country the same effect which they had produced of old in the Roman Republic. The modern Englishman was to the Englishman of the sixteenth century what Verus and Curio were to Dentatus and Fabricius. Those who held this language were as ignorant and shallow as people generally are who extol the past at the expense of the present. A man of sense would have perceived that, if the English of the time of George the Second had really been more sordid and dishonest than their forefathers, the deterioration would not have shown itself in one place alone. The progress of judicial venality and of official venality would have kept pace with the progress of parliamentary venality. But nothing is more certain than that, while the legislature was becoming more and more venal, the courts of law and the public offices were becoming purer and purer. The representatives of the people were undoubtedly more mercenary in the days of Hardwick and Pelham than in the days of the Tudors. But the chancellors of the Tudors took plate and jewels from suitors without scruple or shame, and Hardwick would have committed for contempt any suitor who had dared to bring him a present. The treasurers of the Tudors raised princely fortunes by the sale of places, titles, and pardons, and Pelham would have ordered his servants to turn out of his house any man who had offered him money for a peerage or a commissionership of customs. It is evident, therefore, that the prevalence of corruption in the Parliament cannot be ascribed to a general deprivation of morals. The taint was local. We must look for some local cause, and such a cause will, without difficulty, be found. End of section 4 Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois